Good morning, everybody, and welcome to uh, Surface Shared Learning Workshop. My name is Ewan Leach. I'm the uh, director, the chief executive uh, of SURF. Um, for those of you who have been to a number of them, I will be saying some of the same things you've heard me say in the previous shared um, learning workshops. Um, I am the new uh, Andy Milne. I'm obviously not Andy Milne, and his shoes are far too big to fill, but um, Andy, as some of you will be aware, retired uh, at the beginning of this year, and I've been working uh, with SURF since uh, the beginning of May. Um, I'm familiar with SURF because I've been a SURF uh, judge for the awards before, and obviously the reason, one of the reasons we're here today is to really look at the good case studies um, from the SURF awards, and if you have been an applicant uh, or a winner of the SURF awards or participated in the SURF awards in any way in the past, you'll know that the winning the, of the award is not the end of the story. You don't fill in an application form, uh, have judges come and visit you, and then have a dinner. Um, or a hamper, as happened uh, with the Surf Awards this year. Um, but the whole purpose of the Surf Awards is to look at what the best practice is and look at uh, the learning that we can take and apply elsewhere. And so Surf Working with Scottish Government used the Surf Awards to amplify the good work that is happening um, in community-led regeneration. Um, and uh, today's workshop is looking um, specifically at um, the best practice around most improved places and community-led re regeneration. And so we're going to be hearing from the Tamil Hill Centre, from Campbelltown and from Lark Hall, all of whom received um, awards this year, uh, Tamil Hill for being for community-led regeneration, uh, Campbelltown for being the most improved place, and Lark Hall for uh, it was a special recognition award for um, activities that took place uh, during COVID. And what has been apparent in all the workshops that we've had up till now is that um, there is a lot of learning that has uh, taken from been taken from COVID, and COVID has also meant that people have probably permanently altered their operating practices uh, altogether. So there are some positives that we are able to take out um, of the experiences of the past. 18 months, it, it feels like it's a, a, a apparently increasing amount of time that we're saying that we're learning from uh, this experience. So today's workshop is brought to you with the support of Scotland's Science Partnership, Highlands and Islands Enterprise and Architecture and Design Scotland. And after we've heard from uh, our three award winners this morning um, and had some discussion around uh, what we can learn from uh, their practices. We'll then be hearing from uh, Joanne Boyle from Scottish Government, Phil Prentice from Scotland's Towns Partnership, and Margaret McSporran from Highlands and Islands uh, Enterprise to look at the what is the national picture looking like uh, around community-led regeneration as we go into uh, the new future that is altered by the what we are, have currently been um, experienced. So rather than me um, rambling on, I'm, I'm going to hand over to uh, Jamie Mallon uh, to tell us more about the Tannehill Centre and we'll learn about why they uh, received the award they did for community-led regeneration. So if we can have Jamie, if you unmute yourself and you have successfully shared your screen, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> hi everyone, um, my name is Jamie Mallon, I'm the Business Transformation Manager here at the Tannehill Centre. Um, I've just recently moved house and this morning realised my laptop is at the bottom of my of a box, um, so I'm, I'm currently using my desktop and works. So that's a wee picture of me so you know who I am um, and, and that's my kind of contact details if anyone wants to get in touch. Um, so we are the Tannehill Centre. Um, we are based in Fergusley Park, um, just in the outskirts of Paisley. Um, we are quite a large community facility that was built um, 26 years ago, and actually we, we celebrated our 25th anniversary in lockdown. We've lost your audio, Jamie. Carol, we're, we were doing so well. If Jamie's not with us. It might be that we switch to our next speaker, which I think is James Lafferty from Campbelltown. Yeah, I'm ready, you and I can Are jump you? in. If, if it okay. helps, I can I can easily just uh, 
I think, um, is it Chris is sharing the presentation Chris for me? Is... Okay, thank you. I've stopped Jamie's presentation. Thanks very much. <laughs> and, uh, I, I, was, I was so impressed the fact that you've moved house, we've managed to overcome a bit of a technical difficulty. Um, but we'll move on uh, to uh, James Lafferty, who's from Morgan View Council, and he'll be sharing with us uh, the learning from Campbelltown of the most improved place. James, over to you. Yeah, so Chris, are you okay to move the slides on for me, just if I just say next each time? Is that? Yeah, okay, so my name's James Lafferty. I work with, I've worked with the Island Butte Council for um, longer than I can remember, probably too long. And I've been involved in the regeneration of Campbelltown for the last 15 years and uh, been a local, um, certainly taken a lot of enjoyment out the out the job and where we've now got to. So um, I'm just going to run through some of the place-based regeneration work that we've been doing and highlight that it's certainly not been all me, um, even though it may sound like that in the presentation. There's so many people being involved that you'll hear about. So I'll be, I've got a lot of slides, so I'll speak as quickly as I can and run through them. Okay, next, please. So I've listed the challenges, some of the challenges that we faced. Um, I'm not going to run through all the bullet points. I think the presentation will be available after. It's common to many small towns, especially in the West Coast. So someone had said we were tackling 60 years of underinvestment. Next. So something had to be done. So the council and partners, including the Scottish government and High, got together. We appointed a consultant team to produce a regeneration strategy and action plan. From the start, it was started off by the public sector, but very quickly, the private and third sectors and the community were involved. We, were, we adopted um, a bottom-up approach to regeneration, as Cliff Haig told me during a visit to Campbelltown a number of years back. Next. The first big project delivered in 2006 was the Equilibrium Leisure Centre. This gave people in the town a bit of confidence. Next. We were fortunate to tap into some major infrastructure works with government and European funding to support industries like the renewable industries and other um, marine aquaculture and so on. This led to a number of road improvements, works to the new quay and so on. Next. The roads depot was take, route removed from town, out, to, out of town. There was a new gateway road built that enabled ACA to build affordable new homes to a high standard right in the town centre. Next. Through the core project, the berthing facility was enhanced. It's led to an increased number of visiting sailors who are waiting in the town longer. We also carried out a number of public realm improvements. Next. This is the main part that I've been involved in, the heritage-led regeneration. Over the last 15 years, we've merged three separate projects into one last project somehow. And it's worked really well. And I think that's maybe something we should note as the the long-term investment can make such a difference. At this stage, I want to highlight the role played by our, our funders, particularly Historic Scotland and the Heritage Lottery Fund for the support they've given us over the years. Next. I brought this slide to the start because it's so important to have a base in the town centre. As you can see from the bottom right photo, a lot's changed since 2009. That's, that's Fergus Murray in the, at the back there as well. <laughs> So um, it was a, an open door approach we had and we had the local contractors, community group members, councillors, uh, building owners all popping in and out constantly. But uh, we kept a wee book and it's, it's actually filled now, the visitor's book. So we actually subleased part of the office to um, the South Kandahar Development Trust who will come on to in a wee minute. Next. Initially, we couldn't give the money away in Campbelltown. People were so suspicious of this grant funding that was appearing, and lots of people didn't even know it was a conservation area. So we really started with small-scale works, which a number of quick win projects, like external doors, railings, windows, that type of thing. Next. Shopfronts improvements. This was the first batch done over 12 years ago. These businesses are still thriving now. The one in the bottom, the numero D business, expanded into the unit on the left. Um, employing more local people. Next. We then moved on to community projects, carrying out repairs to community buildings. This helped raise awareness of the projects and what, what could be done. And it also in, fostered a number of partnerships with external group members who ended up helping us out at events and things in the future. Next. 
The first large project we did was deliver, the building was owned by the Kintyre Amenity Trust, the former schoolhouse. And the project was managed by the Strathclyde Building Preservation Trust. We had a wee project team, myself and uh, someone from High were involved. So over six years, we helped the group secure funding of uh, nearly 500,000, including THI and European funding. And it's after an options appraisal, the, the use was decided as a, a backpackers hostel right on the route of the entire way. The income from this building now enables the trust to operate, helps the trust to operate the nearby heritage centre. So it's worked out really well. Next. Campbelltown Town Hall project is probably my favourite, given I'm so, so involved in this one, um, working in partnership with the Development Trust who shared our office at Burnside Square. Next. Over the course of six years, we saved the building from being mothballed and I helped deliver an asset of Council's first big asset transfer to an external organisation. Things were going really, really well for the trust up until the pandemic. I'm sure, I'm sure it'll recover from it. It's been obviously difficult, like a lot of uh, groups at the moment running uh, properties. This one included a big grant of a million pound from the big lottery fund and THI and CORD funded. Next. One of the big problems we faced in Campbelltown and led to the disrepair, but there's been no, there had been no factoring for over 20 years. So we tried to come up with a strategy to tackle this because it was, it was obvious that no factoring companies were going to set up. So we initially did some gutter cleaning, free gutter cleaning works and maintenance events just to raise awareness. We then produced a tenement guide, not a maintenance guide, which is already out there anyway from Historic Scotland and so on. It was more about how owners could get together and the key to this was forming owners associations. We've now got 30 in the town centre looking after properties. We actually made it a condition of our grants for tenements that you had to have an association. This then opened up a door to a small grant from Housing Services for a tenement condition survey and report, which helped with the developing these repair projects. Next. The first few tenements were quite sort of low scale. It was more about improving the appearance of the place. We used silicate paints. I've got to say that this paint still is good 12 years later if it's applied properly, which is a good lesson. We're also fortunate enough to be involved in the £4 million renovation of the Royal Hotel overlooking the harbour. Next. This, pro this building had been put into disrepair, affecting the properties on either side. The owner of the ground floor secured the, the rest of the property from the Crown and through THI funding, we carried, they carried out a full internal and external refurbishment. All these properties, all these tenements were fortunate to receive private sector housing grant from my colleagues in housing services. So it was a real partnership approach. The three-way split worked really well. The cars are THI funding, housing money, and the private owner's contributions. Next. This building sits next to the the town hall and was faced with demolition. There had already been three closures of the street affecting neighbouring businesses. We originally engaged with the existing owners who made it clear that they weren't willing to be involved in a project. So over a number of years, we managed to obtain consent from the council to actually got a back-to-back -back legal agreement in place where we secured the title and within an hour it was transferred to a developer, McLeod Construction from Gilpet who came in and with the help of THI and council grants, they brought it back into use four high quality flats and one business that's since expanded. It's won a number of National Empty Homes Awards, Scottish and National Empty Homes Awards, this property. And this is, I should mention the Area Property Action Group. It was originally a, an informal group of officers from planning, building standards, housing and so on who got together. But it's now been formalised and we meet regularly. There's one in each of our four council areas and we're there to tackle problem buildings. Next. This property, I was going to show a number of slides now, all of which have been subject to full um, repair and conservation ten, uh, communal repair schemes. Some of them I will we'll touch on as some of the other wee aspects to these projects that saved um, over 60 homes and uh, 30 businesses in Campbelltown. You'll see the amenity deck on the right hand side. In Campbelltown, there's a number of properties with rear first floor amenity decks serving as extended areas and roofs for the back, backs of the commercial premises and communal areas for the flats. These were all failing and had to be replaced. So we used the housing money to do that because it wasn't eligible for the cars funding. So it's just been flexible about, flexible about how you do things. Next. 
This property here, the interesting one about this, we had vacant units in the ground floor, so I built in an additional grant condition that meant that within so many months of the six months of the project completion, the owners had to have these units up to a letable standard. It has now meant that they've all been leased out, apart from the pub on the left, which is currently under construction. Kuri Doon are actually relocated from Gurukh, so it was, and they're doing really well in Campbelltown, so it's, it's going great. Next. This is just some of the other um, units we've brought back into use. These are the top ones actually in the, the second half of this tenement. But what we found throughout the years was this a domino effect. When you improve one property, it quite often leads to the neighbouring one. These shops also benefited from the, the shop fronts, the town centre fund that I'm just going to mention. Um, next. This was a really complex project. Boots had tried, Boots the Pharmacy and Bank of Scotland had spent a lot of money trying to repair this failing deck, which was water pouring into their back shop and into the pub in the corner. So after a number of years, we managed to approve, get consent within the council to serve a dangerous building notice. The owners defaulted and we come in and acted as a client with a, a repair package using a grant funding and owner's money. And it's delivered a brand new amenity deck, saving 21 homes and nine shops. Next. The before and after at the top is the pub in the corner that had been vacant 12 years due to the water ingress from the deck. So that was now brought back into use as a seafood restaurant with nine jobs. And both these tenements are subject to full repair schemes working with the owners and their owners associations. Next. Again, the particularly complex project, the existing owners made it, some of them made it clear they didn't want to participate. So we facilitated change of ownership through auctions and all sorts and ended up with owners all willing to invest in the project. Um, there was a dangerous building notice for the ballast in place for those balustrades in the, in the top middle photo. We thought the balustrades were supported by the beam, but as you can see in the bottom photo, it stopped at first floor level, and that's the back of a shop unit. So it's really fortunate what happened there. So we delivered this one, and it's one, again the number, winner of a number of awards. It's, there's a lot of young people, three or four young people, who have actually moved into these flats and are working in the town centre. Next. 2019 may have uh, secured the first tranche of Scottish Government town centre funding. We've since had a wee bit more. So 35 grants awarded for cosmetic works like painting, signage, so on. This was really just to sort of finish off. I could see a gap in what we'd done with all the external fabric repairs, but some of the shop fronts just needed a, a, a lick of paint and so on. So this has been really helpful. Helped eight new businesses and brought 10 vacant units back into use. I've got all the, the backup for all these statistics. Next. Here's another couple of examples. The treehouse, you've noticed from the first photo slide, the shop fronts, this business since relocated into the main street <clears throat> and um, a new business in the top right. Next. Over the years, well, through CARS and THI, we've had extensive training and community engagement programmes. We've delivered over 20 traditional skills, specialist events, training skills events in Campbelltown. Um, attended by local contractors, building professionals and public sector workers for groups like at the bottom, such as the group who worked in the cinema or the town hall, we provided training in uh, fundraising, marketing, illustration and so on. Next. The, TH, the Heritage Trail was formed in uh, 2010 through the THI and delivered weekly tours, which were stopped uh, during the pandemic. But we already had a legacy in place, the digital app, which was, we managed to launch last year, fully funded by Sustrans. It includes a number of trails, including the Heritage Trail and a Whiskey Trail, which includes over 30 former distillery sites. And the good news, the positive news in this, this uh, sector is we've got the likelihood of three new distilleries opening in Campbelltown in the next couple of years. Next. Other projects like um, a professionally designed exhibition um, with the Glasgow Art Club. This was to celebrate the famous Glasgow architects who designed these unique tenements that we have in Campbelltown. A lot of people refer to it as Glasgow by the Sea. Um, other projects such as Campbelltown Community Council, who we worked with on the conservation and repair of Campbelltown Cross. And there was a war memorial project of assisted sustenance project. There's lots of volunteers still working, doing amenity projects, gardening. One of the local Community businesses has just appointed a maintenance officer through one of the new employability schemes. Next. 
We weren't directly involved in this project, but we supported and assisted Carmeltown community business over the last over 12 years in the three million renovation of uh, uh, Carmeltown's picture house. Next. I've got a slide here showing some of the key statistics. I think the one I'd like to point out is the, the bottom two. Um, sorry. Uh, the 3.25 million of funding, levering in 10 million of spend. I think it's really important to show what you can do if you get some funding and how you can make it work. That doesn't include the cinema and lots of other private works that's been going on in and around the town. Next. Last year, we appointed Stantec to deliver an evaluation of the scheme. Now, they had a really good response rate. And as you can see from some of the sort of key bullets, um, all the businesses that responded said it transformed their business. 90% of people said it uh, led to Campbelltown being an improved place and so on. We're just still working up the final report for, for that one and a digital brochure. Next. We're also, the council was fortunate to get secure some Scottish government funding for Scotland Loves Local campaigns and also the Google photography services. Doing some local networking, we've managed to get 30 local businesses signed up for the photography part alone. Next. And the Google Street View has been updated, I should have said, as well for Campbelltown. So key lessons learned, I think patience. It takes time to deliver projects like this. Um, even to secure the funding in the first place it takes so long. You've got to have the sort of staying power. The team effort, I mean, as you can see, there's been so many people involved in this from locally, but also from external organisations throughout the country. And my motto has always been no problems, only solutions. And then I think with the quick wins, you can show that deliverability brings more success, more funding. And probably I should highlight the role of some of the unsung heroes in the council, people that never get mentioned at any of the awards or anything like that, like um, legal procurement, finance. You've got to have that in place. You've got to have these working groups in place and a close link with the council if you're not a council project. Some of the successes, I've just listed the bullet points there, are pretty obvious. And there certainly is a renewed pride of place in Campbelltown, kind of a really vibrant town centre. Thank you, and sorry if I run over, Ewan. It's okay, James. I think it's totally clear why you won the award this year. It is an amazing transformation um, of Campbelltown. Um, and I think there's a lot of points that we may come back up to later. I think one thing that I'm particularly interested in is that is ownership being key. Ownership um, is often a cause of dereliction and neglect. Um, and it's clear that a lot of the untangling you've done there around ownership, um, there's maybe learning uh, to take from that. Um, but we'll possibly now maybe move on to Nancy um, to hear about the Lark Hall Community Network. Um, they won the award for um, a special recognition for the work that they undertook uh, during COVID. So Nancy, are you, yep, you're sharing your screen. Thank you very much. Hi there, thank you very much. Thanks, uh, I'm Nancy and I'm the, the chair of the Larko Community Network, Community Network, which is set up specifically um, to support the, our community through COVID. Um, it's really good to be part of your learning journey this morning. So I hope what we have to present here uh, is of interest. Uh, the Community Network started its life as COVID-19 Rainbows, which was set up specifically, as I say, to, to deal with um, the, the, the problems in our area uh, caused by the, pand the pandemic. After the first six months of um, quite hectic activity, it was agreed by all involved that we should continue um, to, to meet and to be a partnership because of the work that was being done and what was being achieved. Okay, this is our area. These are the partners, um, the NHS, uh, particularly health improvement, but other areas as well. Um, South Lancashire Council, the community engagement team and all other, other departments too. The Voluntary Action South Lancashire, the TSI for South Lancashire the third sector organisations operating within our area and the private sector, which was great and um, that they were able to be involved in this. It was a, a real plus. The start of the process really was before 2020. Uh, we, there was a partnership built on relationships created to deliver the Larkwell Community Plan. And uh, we, we, we sought the views of local people in a, a, a community survey to ask them what were the issues in the town and what were the solutions. So um, this is the chair of the Community Enterprise uh, Committee in South Lancashire Council who um, kindly uh, got his photograph taken with our survey report and some of the, the young folk from Lark Hall Academy. 
um, the, the relationships that were built here um, meant that we were able to trust one another, we knew one another, we could phone one another, and um, the, that then meant that when we moved into the next stage, then things were a bit easier. This is a screen really or just of some of the, the people who benefited from uh, the 34,000 plus interactions that we had with our community, um, which has got 18,000 people. So there was a whole lot of activity uh, going on on the ground. We had 50 volunteers who appeared overnight, uh, who delivered 12,000 leaflets to every house in our area. Um, there were delivery of hot meals, Mr T, who is Heart of Africa, you can see him in the middle with his family there. Um, he was preparing up to 100 meals a day and um, the volunteers with the, uh, were actually delivering these in the, the, the minibuses that belong to a Lark Hall District Volunteer Group, whose kitchen was also being used to uh, produce these meals. Um, the Mr T and Heart of Africa received the Prime Minister's Point of Light Award for his for his activity during COVID. So that was a real plus, uh, good uh, publicity for the community. There were meals, pick me up bags, food bags, food, clothing, and family activity vouchers distributed across the patch, um, prescription pickups and delivery, which was actually done by our local taxi service um, who picked up something like 700 uh, prescriptions over the, the year and delivered them to people, sometimes on a regular basis at no cost which was just great. Um, Christmas meals and packs were delivered. And one chap actually said to us that I thought that our Christmas was going to be so difficult this year. And we are so grateful that you were able to, to bring this these gifts to us, which really helped us because it's all about people and families. Um, there were daily calls to people who are known to us in the community and uh, Sandra from LDVG, her organization uh, did something like 20,000 calls over the year. We had an adopt a neighbour scheme where we encouraged people in their streets to look out to see who was in their area, who was uh, who was okay and who wasn't. And um, if there was any issue, then contact us and we can deliver something or find someone who can offer support. Um, and we decided we hate labels, um, the whole uh, thing about deprivation and vulnerability. So we decided to put wee cards in all the boxes and all the packs to say you're a valued member of this community and you're receiving this for that reason. So uh, that helped us to say that um, it, it wasn't just people who were who were poor and who couldn't help themselves. So um, that was a big issue for us because really COVID affected everybody. We received funding, uh, of, on, I think for £100,000 I think we received uh, from a number of sources. And this was managed by two of the partners, Lark Hall District Volunteer Group and Lark Hall Community Growers, who disseminated, recorded and reported on behalf of the network for that funding. The total investment that was created and leveraged from that was actually three times the funding that we received and that was made up of in-kind contributions by volunteers, local donations, local partner contributions and local businesses. And this information has been pulled together into a report that is available for anybody who wants to use it. And um, we can, if you get in touch with me, then we can pass that on. This, I'm, I'm a visual person, and this is kind of a simple uh, picture of what this actually meant to me. Uh, funders streamlined the processes, and so it was much easier to make contact and to have interactions. The interactions with their partners, particularly the third sector, was as equals in terms of the third sector. We were kind of seen as the, the sort of poor relations in the past, I think. Well, that's been our experience down here in Lark Hall, and kind of feel that that changed as a result of um, our experience in the last year and a half. Uh, the inclusion of the private sector, I believe, opens up new types of support for our communities going forward. It's almost like there's a pool of people who want to help, they just don't know how to do it. And I believe that our network will enable that to, to be expanded and to work better going forward. The third sector was already on the ground supporting the community and through this we've developed new ways of working together in order to make things better for local people. Challenges. Governance was definitely our first challenge. It was partnerships coming together, at a Zoom meeting and hitting the ground running basically. So while we all had our own policies in place, we were not a constituted group. And when new volunteers came along, there was no time or capacity to interview them, 
to take them through an induction process or to give them any training. So any information on who we are, what we were trying to do, what parameters that we were setting was done when we met them on the ground doing things or um, by email, which was really, it, it raised a few issues, which we just tackled head on and um, quickly, and hopefully there's no, um, no repercussions from that. GDPR was a real issue, I think, for us, and I, the, the statutory services weren't able to share um, with us anyone on their books that needed help. And our, we were trying to make sure that no one in our communities fell through the gap, and we felt that that was a gap. And so we had to trust the partners themselves to actually um, help us to, to find who the people with specific issues were and the schools and, and, and where they can't tell you who the, 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 the pupils are or the, the parents are, we were able to give them things that they then passed out. So that was how we dealt with it on the ground. But I do think there is an issue with GDP, GDPR and, and, and uh, this kind of thing going forward. And I believe this is an opportunity to look at how we might make that better. I fear that there, there are some people in our community that didn't get the, the service that they could, they could have got because we were there on the ground because we didn't know about them, and that's sad. Trust was an issue. It was key to all that was being done in the first months. And while some of us already knew one another and had that trusting relationships, lots of people came on board that we didn't really know. So um, there were a few hiccups in relation to that because everybody comes with their own motives and their own ideas of what is the right thing to do. And because things had to happen so quickly, um, sometimes that uh, sharing of information had to be done by phone calls and various different ways. So um, it could have been better, but given that it was an emergency, I don't see how we could have improved on it at the beginning. Uh, but as I say, we dealt with these things very quickly and then we just moved on. Utility bill support was an issue for us because um, the mechanism, mechanisms in place didn't lend themselves very well to what we were trying to achieve. I think there are new ways in place now, but at the time um, it was very difficult and we didn't want to hand over cash. That was a bit of an issue for us. Uh, encouraging uh, encouragement through the stages, I think, was almost like personal to people. Um, COVID messages brought fear and anxiety to many, many people. And, and there was confusion because things were changing. It was different in Scotland and England, and people just weren't very sure of exactly what they could and couldn't do. And as I say, there was a fear and anxiety. And our, part of our job was actually to, to help folk rather than deliver food parcels to the door. We started to deliver vouchers so that they could actually make the effort to go out and do some things for themselves when it was uh, possible to do that. So that was a challenge. And it was individual because different people felt different things about the whole and the whole government, the whole um, uh, restrictions thing. Okay. Unintended consequences. Many things happened that we hadn't planned, we hadn't foresaw, and we couldn't ever have imagined. But in fact, I believe that we have a stronger community support structure in place than we had in 2019. We weren't thinking about this, we didn't plan for it, but it's there. There's a greater awareness of the value of community-led delivery services across the whole of Scotland, I believe. And uh, the first sector organisations working at the coalface have been a treasure, in some cases only just discovered. And I think that they have the power to attract funding to approve an area uh, for local people that perhaps wasn't really recognised before or appreciated. And I think that they have shown that they're not the poor relation going forward. Um, I'm wondering really too if the, the name third sector doesn't really fit anymore. Maybe, um, maybe we're not really third in the line. Maybe we could be uh, renamed. So if anybody's got any ideas, we can ban them about. Connections with amazing people. There was a lady that uh, has an autistic child who came, became a volunteer with us and she has such an amazing heart for other people. And she has shown that um, just ordinary people doing ordinary things can have such a huge impact in the lives of others when there's a great need. And she's gone on to be a volunteer with one of the organisations in the town. To folks in the public sector who have joined our meetings and caught the vision of what is possible in the future and gone away to think about how we can work together to make things better and to do it in a better way. 
um, voluntary, uh, the focus on volunteering, the 15 new volunteers came out of the woodwork, as I say, some of them were on furlough, so they might be able to do evening stuff, but there has been an increase in the number of people who want to volunteer in our community going forward, and I think that if you take away all the volunteers in our community, I'm sure it'll fall apart. Uh, so I believe that this is a thing that we need to build on. It's, it's happened, people have been aware of it, so I think we need to build on and, and uh, grow it going forward. Good publicity. That was something that we hadn't really reckoned on either, but uh, it's really great that the people who worked very, very hard on the ground and took risks to a certain extent, uh, going to the door with masks on to hand things over to people was risky. Uh, but however, uh, all was well and there weren't any huge incidents. But it's great that these people can be recognised uh, for the work that they've done and that our community uh, and can, the, the, the reputation of our particular community of Lark Hall um, can be changed in a positive way, which is good. I was trying to think what actually made this work? What was it in underlying things that made it work? And one of the, the key things was the existing relationships. The relationships locally, and with those people in the public sector that we had already had relationships with, uh, and some of the funders that we already knew was a, a key part of how this developed. It helped us to move quickly. And we spoke to one another, we knew each other, we trusted each other, and we were able to start talking about it very quickly. The number of organisations involved made the pool of knowledge immense and the reach on the ground much wider because we were all dealing with different areas or groups in the community. Um, even the local churches who had a Christmas um, appeal expected to raise something like £2,000 and they got 4600 So people caught the vision. People um, were actually recognising that some other folk in the community were having difficulties and they were prepared to step up to the plate and, and, and contribute where they could. I think the common purpose, we, we were all, it was, that's what it was, we were all there uh, aiming for the same thing, to make life better for those who were really struggling. We used what was already there, the community transport uh, uh, for deliveries, the lighthouse hub to store food and produce, and the church halls for um, being able to pack great big huge loads of things. And the key people caught the vision. The decision makers, the ones who could authorise spend, the ones who could agree project development and who could agree engagement, it was really crucial that they were on board right at the very beginning. There was a steering group of five local third sector organisations who met regularly to assess what the need was and how that changed over the, excuse me, over the course of the year and a half. And that, that leadership was crucial uh, and it's still there. Okay, the future. As I say, in the early stages, we didn't have any governance. We just hit the ground running and did the best that we could. Now we have been working with P4P and we have a memorandum of understanding and operational processes in place to, to take us forward. We operate with subgroups. One of those subgroups was social prescribing and the NHS brings in the link workers. So we uh, did a, a six week a weekly meeting of this subgroup looking at what's happening on the ground, what can the local third sector organisations contribute, where uh, can people come to be supported on their personal well-being journey. So that was actually hailed as something very positive in South Lanarkshire because we were the only town that did this. So the girl who came into, South, into Lark Hall had something to start with where the other workers had to start from scratch. And at the moment that seems to be working well for the community. We will welcome new partners, anyone who wants to do anything to improve the quality of life of people in our areas, then we, they're welcome to come and join our, our, our partnership. We will deliver joint projects. The Lark Hall Community Plan will come under the, the umbrella of uh, Lark Hall Community Network. There's a town centre project. We've got some funding to do improvements to the town centre and that comes and will come under the auspices of, of the network as well. We will continue to share knowledge and information within the guidelines, of course. And um, that is a big plus because as I say, there are lots of organizations dealing with lots of different age groups. So bringing all that together is a big plus. And we will continue to promote the town, the area and the value of equal partnerships, which I think is really crucial going forward. Okay. Lastly, the pandemic has brought so much heartbreak, lots of fear and anxiety, but there are lessons to be learned. 
and there are real gem, gems of opportunity that we hope when we look back in five years time, we'll be able to say that these were recognized and developed. And we believe that together we can make a difference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nancy. That was fantastic. Um, and um, lots of things within there. I think some of the points you made around us being able to take risks, and that was something that happened across the pandemic, that accepting that risk can happen, but um, the way you dealt with things head on, also uh, very important. And even I think you're rightly pointing out that the title of third sector, you know, it embeds a power dynamic there, um, which is uh, probably is problematic. Um, but we'll move quickly on or back to um, Jamie Mallon, who I think we have back in the call. So Jamie, if you unmute yourself, and I think Chris is going to share your uh, thing. So actually, Jamie, I know you were talking, and you didn't know we couldn't hear you. So we got to the point where you said that you had just celebrated uh, the Tannehill Centre's 21st anniversary. Hi there, can you hear me now? We can hear you. Excellent, excellent. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so we celebrated our 25th anniversary in lockdown. Um, um, so where was that? I've lost my place. Um, so the centre had transferred to community ownership in 2006 and become a subsidiary of the local housing association. Closely following that, there was a funding bid to redevelop the building, but that was unsuccessful and precipitated a decline in the fortunes of the centre. So over time, the centre became less responsive to community needs, was underutilised, and the result wasn't valued by local people. In 2006, the Housing Association, the parent company, um, had gone through a number of changes, and as part of that, looked to, um, looked to um, change how the Tannehill Centre um, responded to local people's needs. Um, and as a result of support from Scottish Government and CEIS, sorry, next slide, please. Um, they carried out community research and desk research, and that really found um, three key things. Firstly, the Tannehill Centre was unwelcoming and unresponsive to community needs, um, and the services it did deliver were very poor. Um, secondly, its relationship with wider stakeholders were poor or strained, um, and we had really disengaged with local networks and partners, which meant that we weren't kind of um, switched on to what was happening locally. Um, and these together um, had a real significant impact on the reputation of the centre, um, to the point where, whilst it was deserving of criticism, many of the issues local people and stakeholders had with the centre were kind of based on untrue assumptions. So for example, it had a reputation of being quite expensive to hire, in actual fact, it was, and we still are, um, one of the more um, affordable community spaces um, throughout Renfrewshire. Next slide, please. So, um, our executive committee um, brought in a new leadership team, which includes myself and a number of my colleagues, and adopted a three-year business plan. And that three-year business plan can be summarised um, in the following. So, in terms of short-term goals, kind of quick wins, we wanted to show that we were responding to local people's needs. So in that community consultation, there was an understanding that um, people wanted more services for um, children, young people. They wanted to be part of Paisley's bid to become um, a city of culture. Um, and they just wanted more services in general within the building. We wanted to re-engage with partners uh, and develop better relationships with local organisations and Remshire wide organisations. And we also wanted to show that change was taking place. We wanted to make sure that, that was visible. Um, so we, we changed quite a lot of how the centre looks um, as you come in. In terms of medium term, the focus was more on raising uh, awareness of us and what we do, um, looking to attract um, funding to deliver services, and then to deepen the impact of our work so that um, every, every penny we were, were spending had an impact. And more long term, we're looking at how do we generate income for um, social enterprise activities, how do we sustain funding we attract, and lastly, how do we develop, redevelop the building, because it's 25 years old, it's had no investment, if someone slams the door in the next room, my phone goes off. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, it's in much need of um, some TLC. Initially, our successes were rather mixed, so in terms of short-term stuff, 
partnership working we, we worked really well we were able to make visible changes but we also started to deliver services in response to our community consultation but people weren't accessing them um, and we didn't really understand why so we then went back to people and just started having conversations um, and it's at that point um, our kind of understanding of what people needed changed next slide please Um, so a local activist kind of said to me, for all my life, I've been told that Ferguson Park has been regenerated and it's had waves and waves of regeneration, but I'm still living in a community riddled with poverty. When does this regeneration come to an end? And for me, I think this quote sums up many of the frustrations and tensions that local people feel when um, professionals like myself um, come into Ferguson Park and say, right, I'm going to deliver this, I'm going to change things, etc, 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 then we move on. So reflecting on this, we took a very different approach um, and that's when we started to engage people in far more informal settings and conversations. Um, so as a result of this, our kind of short-term aims um, dramatically changed and it was more about working alongside people in groups uh, to deliver services instead of delivering services on their behalf that they can then access. So our kind of a change approach, I looked, looked at it like this. Next slide, please. So we were able to access funding to run a kind of arts festival. But what we did is we managed the relationship and we sourced artists and we paired them up with local groups and organisations um, to design a kind of um, artistic and cultural intervention within the community. We also developed what are called SRGs, self-reliant groups. So we worked with an organisation called Weevolution to set up um, SRGs. So these are groups that come together to support one another, learn a skill together and use a skill to generate an income. So we had people making soap. Uh, we've got Andy who made his mum's ginger wine for Christmas. Um, we had sewing groups, etc, etc. We also ran a youth participating budgeting programme. So we had £25,000 and it was local people who decided um, how that should be spent. So they set the criteria. It was local people who came up with ideas for what could be funded and it was local people who um, voted on which of those projects should be supported. And what we quickly realised is that we were acting as a community anchor um, and we realised that that's what people were wanting. They were wanting an organisation that could support local people take action rather than deliver services on their behalf. Um, next slide, please. And a kind of key realisation of that is local activists I mentioned earlier on um, kind of said, a lot of money has been spent in Fergusley over the years. However, this is the first time that local community has decided what we need and what resources we need to achieve this. Um, so in terms of moving forward, again, there's nothing new in what we're doing. Um, we take an asset-based approach, building in the strengths of the community, such as its strong community spirit, um, deeply held sense of identity and determination to be self-reliant. And much like um, Lark Hall, Fergus Park has an unfair reputation um, and what people say to me is actually there's lots of elements of Fergus Park that people would love to have in their own community but they don't have so we talk about that um, and whilst that's standard practice for community development workers and um, for a community that's ex ex experienced that constant media and professional tension due to the poverty and deprivation it's, it's had it was quite refreshing to the local community for us to be saying well no here's your strengths here's what you're really good at let's focus on that we constantly communicate to folk that we're not here to tell them what to do or how to do things. Instead, we're here to listen and support them. Um, and we make sure our actions kind of reflect this. Next slide, please. That's then had a kind of an impact on our medium term incomes. So in terms of funding, we've been really successful in attracting £1.2 million. Pounds. And again, rather than that being money that's just kind of focused on the centre, um, we, we try to act as a magnet, so we try to kind of bring money in, but also look at how do we um, make sure that that reaches all parts of the community. So, for example, through our participatory budget, through our community development programme, um, and also through our volunteering programme. So we, we provide local groups of resources. We also provide local people with the opportunity to develop their skills. Um, and during lockdown, our volunteer numbers grew to over 60 people from about 10 um, and our volunteer opportunities are open to anyone. So that could be those volunteering in other groups. It could be those who are yet to volunteer but want to develop a skill so they can then put that 
back into the local community. And then there's the recognition. So um, we have developed wider rec awareness. People now approach us and say, we want to work with you. Um, but we also um, try and do, uh, again, much like Lark Hall, we try and tell the positive stories about Fergus for Park. Um, so we talk about our volunteers. We tr quite often try to get them in the paper to tell their stories and things like that. Um, next slide, please. And that's also impacted on our COVID-19 response. Um, so, for example, um, if it wasn't for taking that asset-based approach, if it wasn't for acting as a community anchor, many of our partners that we relied on to work alongside during the COVID response wouldn't have existed because many of those groups came about as a result of our participating budgeting programme. Um, another big thing is, as a result of building trust and relationships with these people, um, they, they come to, they've come to us and asked for um, support. Um, so, for example, during the lockdown, one of our community groups agreed to do the kind of food distribution. And kind of said, we've got volunteers, that kind of, it's taken us an hour to, to deliver a food package because they're having to walk the length of the scheme back. Um, and we were quickly able to put them in touch with an organisation that provided them with um, community transport. Um, and then there's the kind of relationships. So, yeah, because we've had that trusted organisation, um, we've been able to work with one another more closely. Also, we've benefited from the relationship that many smaller groups have in the community. So we're able to reach people that we other, otherwise wouldn't have reached. Um, and again, kind of reflecting some of the stuff that, that um, Lark Hall kind of spoke about earlier on, um, that you, you were kind of benefiting from, from that kind of network of skills, that network of, of um, experience. Next slide, please. It's also changed our longer term plans. So we're still looking to redesign and redevelop the Tannehill Centre, but we're looking at it now as a community anchor organisation. So how do we use our building better to support smaller local groups? You know, do we have spaces for them to store their goods? Do we have spaces for them to meet? Do we have spaces for them to act as kind of small office spaces? In terms of social enterprise activity, again, we're not just being looking at ourselves, we're looking at other organisations. So could um, we support other small local groups become more sustainable by supporting them to, for example, um, get a contract with a local housing organisation to cut the grass rather than ourselves? Is there stuff we could be doing collaboratively? Um, is there stuff that we can, that other people are better placed to do? Um, and again, looking at how do we secure long-term funding? Um, and again, that's not just about the Tannehill Centre, it's about how do we continue to act as that magnet to pull in resources and disseminate that out into the wider community. Next slide. Um, thinking about what uh, our key reflections are, I think initially it was about don't just listen, listen. So we had that initial community consultation, but actually it took us to sit down and converse with people to develop those relationships to get a true understanding of what people wanted and how people wanted to be involved. Um, working as a community anchor, working with other organisations means you have to give up quite a lot of control. Um, and I think it's just about being comfortable with that. Um, and also, because of that, look at how do you build flexibility into your plan. So for us, we quite often can't determine what the output of our work is going to be, but we focus on the outcome. So, for example, if we're submitting an application for funding, we aren't able to say, here's the events, here's the activities that will be delivered, but we are able to say, here are the organisations we're working with, here is the number of volunteers, and here are the skills people are going to develop. Um, so that I would say that that would be our, our kind of key reflections. Um, next slide, please. Oh. So that's me. Um, apologies for the earlier um, technical issues. Um, I would welcome anyone to come along and visit. I would welcome folk to kind of look at our Twitter, Facebook pages. Um, once we're open, um, more generally to the public, I'm happy to show you around, happy to introduce you to some of the, the projects and volunteers we work with, um, and I, I would encourage you to, to keep in touch. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Jamie, and um, we should say to everyone that um, 
we were all plan we were planning that um, today's event would have been at the Tanahill Centre, so you'd have had an opportunity to visit the centre and for David to give us uh, to show us firsthand uh, uh, what they had achieved there. Um, I'd ask them for some questions. A question from Phil from Phil Prentice to the three speakers. What's the what was the biggest what's the biggest barrier for you? Uh, you've all been quite solution focused, but he's what has been the biggest barrier? James. People, people dealing with personalities and people and how to overcome that. Okay, so that's an interesting that's an interesting and probably identifiable response, Nancy. I think probably um, the the credibility and trust that um, people might have in organisations as small as ours trying to do something in our community. I think um, we probably aren't seen as really uh, having been of any worth in the past uh, or very much. And I think when we come together um, with the bringing skills and knowledge together, then I think people have actually we had to set up and take notice of what's happening in our communities. And I believe that that is a really good thing going forward. And I think it's something that we really have to build on. And I do, I have to be honest and say that I think in the public sector, I have noticed that there are, there are changes. Some of the people that we're working with now, their attitudes are changing and that they want to, to sort of engage with us. Um, I hope that runs through the whole patch, but um, uh, hey, Rome wasn't built in a day. Okay, thank you very much. And um, Jamie, what would you say the biggest barrier is? Um, I, I would agree with both folk. I think for us, um, people and personalities was a major issue. Um, what was really reflect, refreshing about the COVID response is quite a lot of people put their issues and personalities aside in order to achieve a common goal. Um, so I think my learning from this is actually if you've got that common goal and if there's leadership around that, you can overcome those issues. Sorry for being solution focused, but um... <laughs> well, that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> but but you've all actually, I mean, you've all it's actually you've all talked about some the relationship thing. I mean, is is a is a slow thing. It, it's not relevant to funders. Um, and the time that that sort of that sort of aspect of uh, community development work or uh, place making takes. Um, is important. Another question that's come in from Margaret McSwaran is about how strongly you've all stressed collaboration being, but she's asking the, the key learning and establishing and keeping collaborations productive and positive. So I think actually you've had, some of you have talked about COVID being really collaborative and positive. How do you think you can maintain that? Will I go first this time? Yeah. Jamie? Um, I think it's about um, making sure your collaboration and partnerships are relevant. So I wouldn't force it. Um, I think we've all sat around committee meetings where we've been told we have to be there. Um, there's diagrams, there's strategies, there's plans. But actually, I think the really relevant partnerships, the ones that work, uh, is where you're all there because you want to be there. Um, so I wouldn't force it. And I think some partnerships have natural endings, some some don't. Um, so yeah, that would be my advice. Okay, thanks. James or Nancy? Um, well, I think from our perspective, we um, just before COVID uh, so it came on upon us, then we had just completed our survey uh, of, of Lark Hall. So uh, I think the what's contained in the survey report and the action report um, will be the basis of how we take things forward and all folks around the table um, have have got an input to that because they're dealing with different age groups, different people, different types of groups. So really it covers all of the partners and I think, as I said before, one of the key things for me is uh, engaging with the private sector. People, these companies want to help but they don't, they don't see the mechanism to be able to do that and I see that as something that we need to focus on going forward. Okay, that's that's a good point. I, mean, I was aware of you mentioning that, and Phil, that might be something of interest to you with the, I suppose, the bids, bids or, or or the new form of bids. Uh, James, is there anything you to add to that? Yeah, sorry, I had, I should have came in first again. Um, I probably don't have much to add. But the current sort of phase of council-led regeneration in Campbelltown sort of come to an end, but there is a lot of other activity now taking place, you know, led by other groups and town, another town centre action plan by the community council and partners, there's the resilience group forum through the pandemic and so on. So no, probably no more to add, really. 
Okay, thanks very much. I, I mean, I think we, we, yesterday we had a, or the, the day before yesterday, we had a meeting with Audit Scotland who are looking for good um, case studies of how things have changed during COVID. Um, and actually, Nancy, without even hearing your presentation, what has happened in Lark Hall came to my mind. But the discussion we had with them is reflecting a lot of what you and um, Jamie have said around people letting go of control, the ability for um, public bodies to take risks, um, all of which kind of happened during COVID. And um, there's that sort of issue of, can we maintain that um, um, devolution of power uh, to community groups um, and the devolution of money? And I think actually, uh, James, some of your examples there of small amounts of money making a difference for quick wins actually around perceptions uh, so that people have confidence also ties in with that. Th thank you to all three of you for um, your presentations. I think they, they are all things that we can learn from. And I think and we've had questions in the chat. This The presentations will be available afterwards and the recording of this will also be going online. Emma will be emailing it to you and it'll be going on our website. It's normally uh, on our website by Friday, depending on, on how smooth the recording uh, has gone. So we're going to go now from what we've been hearing at the local level um, but now look at sort of the national picture. I'm, I'm going to invite um, Joanne Boyle from the Scottish Government to uh, uh, uncloak, uh, to reveal herself. Hi, Joanne, and unmute. Oh. And we already have her presentation shared. So over to you, Joanne. Thanks very much, uh, Ewan. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, as Ewan said, I'm, I'm Joanne, and I'm the team leader for Regeneration Strategy in Scottish Government. Um, and so um, what I've been asked to do uh, this morning is just give you a, a brief overview of the, the government policies for place-based regeneration. Um, it's a bit hard to follow the previous uh, presentations, I think, which are all super interesting and have lots of great slides. And I'm afraid government uh, policy never really seems to have the same uh, buzz. But there you go. We'll do our best with it. Um, so my colleague Ian Murray, um, he's one of the judges for these um, fantastic awards and he spoke to you at the awards event recently, but he's on holiday, so um, it, hence it's my turn today. Uh, and thanks to uh, Ewan and Kate Nema and all at SURF uh, for the invitation. Um, so I'm pleased to be here and I really enjoy hearing all those um, great presentations and, and just brings to life uh, for me and much more the kind of work that uh, me and my team and indeed the regeneration unit are involved with because um, I started this job on the screen um, sort of over a year ago and I'm still on the screen and uh, I'm really looking forward to getting opportunities to actually go out and meet some of you in real life and see in real life uh, some of the, the great projects. Um, so, you know, today um, what you're trying to do to showcase and share um, things that work and, and, and things that don't work so well um, is really important to go forward, um, inspiring others and, and, and helping others learn. And it, it also what it does is the feedback back that we get on that really helps us in, in developing policy and in working with ministers and in working then connecting across um, with um, all the other organisations and sectors. Um, so, so on the first slide, just to just, uh, that reminder of what the government approach is to uh, regeneration. So it's very much around place-based regeneration. And as we've heard from all the speakers, it's very much about it being community-led, about partnerships and, and working with uh, and for communities. Um, so that's that links to um, how this that's set out in, in the place principle, um, which is the kind of government uh, principle or policy on that, which is built in. Uh, to all the strategy documents that we've got and beyond into local government, et cetera. So again, about it's about building on the local knowledge and the skills um, and the resources um, that you have. Um, and we have seen that in all the presentations and in what's developed over the last year um, during the pandemic, how local communities have, have really responded to that um, and, and made a real difference. Um, in a, in a slightly different way than, than perhaps before. So, you know, some, some real positives from that, despite obviously um, a lot of difficulties through the year for people. So, I mean, thinking about place-based regeneration, you know, obviously you got to think straight back to 
in the outcomes, it's a means to an end. And the, the end goal is, you know, if, if I was to put it uh, in one phrase, it's about an inclusive net zero economy. Um, so uh, we can think about that in terms of um, all the um, green economic, environmental and social issues that we've got um, in, in communities which have suffered from disadvantage, remoteness and other challenges. But yeah, um, I think that's that's what we're trying to get to is that um, inclusivity, the challenges of net zero and the economy. Um, so just how we're going to, to work together to do that. If, if you want to flick me to the next slide, that would be great. So the, the government initiatives around this is, um, I'm sure you've all heard about the Place Based Investment Programme. Um, so that's, it's a new programme, but what it's trying to do is pull together what we've already got and build on that. And so there's 325 million um, for, to, to get that going over the next five years, but that's connecting in, it's not a 325 on its own, it's connecting into other Place Based Programmes. That's the idea. Um, and I think it was mentioned in, in the talk, the need for long term investment. So at least that's this is a good thing. We at least have got that comfort that it is a five year uh, program and hopefully it will go beyond that. Um, so, again, that's about support and community led generation. Um, it's about place and uh, 20 minute neighbourhoods very much uh, part of that now as a, a pro recent program for government commitment and, and one that um, ministers have emphasised they want to carry forward in future um, and um, it, as I say, building on the regeneration capital grant fund that we had and the town centre fund which we've had for the last sort of year and a half or so. So the idea of the programme is it's about linking and aligning place-based funding initiatives, as I've mentioned, streamlining delivery um, for, for more impact. So the Town Centre Action Plan Review is another piece of work that we're doing um, and we're working um, with partners to respond to the independent review, which was led by or uh, chaired by Elise Sparks and supported by Scotland's Town Partnership. Um, so uh, the, the vision for that, the ministers have already signed up to agreeing that the vision for towns, which is about people, planet and economy. Uh, so the next step is to try and turn what we've learned through the review into some actions going forward um, so that we can kind of carry forward and work towards achieving that vision. So the review group has also asked in the programme for government, I mentioned about 20 minute neighbourhoods, to consider that. And the idea of that is about people being able to meet their needs within a roughly 20 minute walk of their homes. Um, about living well locally, really. Um, the Scotland Loves Local programme, you saw, I think, one of the slides um, with some visuals on that. Um, um, and that's a programme which um, began with a marketing campaign that um, STP uh, initiated and government supported. And it's developed into something where the ministers are really behind this and have wanted, as part of their manifesto, to commit um, up to £10 million pounds um, to deliver a, a long a long term program, so we've had um, the marketing campaign uh, kicked off a, a, a fourth phase uh, very recently, fifth of July, and we've also um, had the launch of the loyalty card scheme. So that's rolling out over the summer, working with local authorities and others uh, to deliver that. Um, and then uh, quite soon we're going to make an announcement on what we're doing with the rest of the program in terms of the ten million. Of course, I can't say too much more about that because ministers like to keep their announcements and not um, not spill all the beans <laughs> before. Um, um, so business improvement districts have also been mentioned by speakers earlier um, and um, that's a really important way of bringing people together to collaborate which is what we're talking about very much here um, and, and primarily obviously focused around businesses but there's also other models of collaboration that are being developed uh, with STP such as community improvement districts. And uh, those uh, business improvement districts have had a, a good support from government last year um, um, and a further support this year. So last year was actually 4 million um, that uh, supported both business improvement districts, towns and the previous Scotland Love Local campaign. So that was, that was COVID related funding really. 
Um, yeah, so, and the final thing then is, is you'll be aware of the Empowering Communities Programme and uh, the, the COVID related programmes, community recovery funds, et cetera, that have um, been provided last year and those um, will continue. And I think uh, those have been a great support for communities um, to be able to respond to the recent challenges and previously um, the, the, the ongoing uh, program uh, to support people uh, to deliver in their communities and build their expertise. Um, and the last thing is the just to mention the Our Place website. It's taken a bit of time to get that going, but that and we are promised that that will come soon, um, and that will provide lots of information, including probably linking to some of these projects, so people can see um, some sort of best practice ideas. Uh, it will include some of these uh, award winners for the surf projects, and uh, it'll have a kind of how to guide and how to do place based approaches on it, and it'll it'll be built. So. Any feedback you have once you see that, please do share because the idea is this should be a useful resource for everyone. So I hope that kind of run through helps demonstrate um, what we're trying to do around place-based lead generation with you and our commitment to that. And um, thanks again to SURF for all the hard work um, on the awards and for pulling this, um, this session together today. Um, so I look forward to uh, seeing the continued future projects and hearing about um, all the learning and the sharing that has contributed um, to those successes. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Joanne. Um, that was great and great to see a sort of long term um, sustained investment um, in place based regeneration um, with the areas that you've highlighted, which I think we're probably all aware of that these are the priorities not just for government, but for the planet. Um, and I, I think the projects that we've heard from, I think I'd say is looking at a note that I had on Campbelltown was that it's been a sort of 14 to 15 year long project of investment uh, to turn Campbelltown into the, um, the Phoenix that it is, uh, it is today. So it is quite a long term project. And also I suppose uh, reflecting on um, what Jamie said um, from the time it was then to people saying, when does this regeneration actually end? And I suppose it's making, it's making tangible outcomes uh, a, a achievable. But also I'm conscious of um, James in the chat referring to catchy buzzwords and obviously 20 minute neighborhoods are the catchy buzzwords uh, of today. A sense of place has also been a catchy buzzword. Um, Surf is the host for the 20 minute neighborhood practice network. We'll put the link into it, which we'll be meeting next week for the first time. Um, which is a catchy buzzword, but it seems to be one that um, captures people's attention in a way that people can understand a 20 minute neighborhood conceptually, maybe slightly better than the place principle, which is good, um, but maybe more theoretical, but the 20 minute neighborhood seems to have something tangible about it. And if that goes into the national uh, planning framework, then we have a, at least a 10 year commitment to deliver up, to focus on a particular uh, place-based policy. But thank you very much uh, for that, Joanne. We'll move swiftly on to, um, I think it's Phil that is next. And Phil, can you spill the beans? Joanne said she wasn't going to spill the beans on what ministers want to do. Phil, you're surely going to spill some beans. No, I've just eaten all the beans. Um, <laughs> I didn't get any breakfast, so I put some beans on my toast. Uh, Joanne knows me better that I would never spill her beans, other ministers' beans. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen if that's possible. You got me? Success, yep. Fantastic. Okay, um, morning everybody, still just about morning. Uh, STP, Scotland's Towns Partnership, are the proud sponsors of SURF Scotland's Most Improved Place Award. We've been working in partnership with SURF over the last number of years. What was formerly known as our Most Improved Town is now known as our Most Improved Place. I think it's really relevant because there just is a growing recognition of the importance of place on the economy, on the environment, on people, the culture, the heritage, the health and well-being. So place and the Scottish Government's approach to place now, uh, I think, is, is one of the most innovative in the world. Um, what's growing in terms of what's apparent is community has a massive role to play in all of that. I mean, these are your places, so if you're not prepared to fix them, don't expect somebody else to come along and do it. I think that's the key message that 
the art of the possible that's been discussed with the former last year's awards winner is really important, you know, to showcase what can be done with collaboration, with leadership, with a bit of innovation, with patience. But the key thing is um, obviously, um, you know, it's the partnership, it's the collaboration and just that strong local leadership and, and determination. So I'm gonna fly through these slides because most of the stuff um, has already been discussed, but STP exists to try and help you with all of this agenda. So we have a number of resources and case studies and so on that we can actually, you can utilize as participants, as people on the ground, as people who want to put in for an award next year. So it is a complex piece. You can see a snapshot of our membership, everything from, you know, the absentee institutional investors who own our shopping centres through to social enterprises, transport, energy, digital, community, culture. So we try to connect all of those threads together, which gives us a knowledge base that we can help you ultimately whenever you're looking at localised solutions. Quick fly through last year, the last 18 months or so, started off with the uh, capital boost for towns followed up by COVID then landed. We had our bids recovery fund. We had our towns and bids resilience and recovery fund. There was a further injection by Scottish government uh, later in the year for more capital investment. We had the Love Local program. Obviously we were running the uh, new feature for Scotland's towns review to sort of try and encourage uh, a step change in our policy approach. And as Joanne's already pointed out, there's been a major step forward in terms of a place-based investment fund of 325 million, 140 million of which has already been allocated to local authorities for specifically for their towns. Uh, we are the host organization for Scotland's improvement districts. Uh, the pandemic basically put the improvement districts into the shop window and showed their relevance and importance. Hyperlocal knowledge, i.e. we know who needs help. We know the people who can give help. We can act as lobby for our local business community. The people who have been dropped through the net are overseen um, you know, through the business support funds, etc. So the bids have been really, really helpful throughout this pandemic and continue to be so. So just bear that in mind that, you know, the new models that we're trying to push, the community improvement district, that's bringing the community. So for example, the development trust, the community council, uh, alongside the businesses, alongside local authority, alongside the corporates to say, look, this is our place. Collectively, we've got a role to play and maybe the community's better at bringing in national lottery funding or Scottish government funding, investing in communities, et cetera, the, the recent community ownership fund. The businesses can bring in a revenue stream that can employ staff and get things done on the day-to-day -day basis. So it's taking that more holistic approach. And even in some of the smaller towns, we're seeing business improvement districts really stepping up to the plate and doing a lot of good work. So not only is there the community improvement district, but we've got the UK's first digital improvement district. We've got the UK's only uh, food and drink improvement district. And we're seeing a big growth in tourism improvement districts as well. So the models there, it can be flexible. It can be the traditional city centre. It can be a town, but it also has a number of variants that we're trying to explore further and encourage. This is the review that uh, has been referred to a new future for Scotland's towns. There's been a very uh, wide engagement across social sector, looking at inclusion, thinking about net zero, looking at a change in demographic, thinking about COVID, post-COVID environment, looking at all those opportunities and trying to weave them into uh, what will become the next town centre action plan later this year. So uh, things are moving, we, we are taking account of all of the change in dynamic across society. I, I would encourage people just to go and have a look at that. You can find it on the um, futuretowns.scot website. There's a dedicated website towards it. There's a simple read, there's a more detailed read, but even just go in and have a look at what we're trying to achieve here. And I think it'll give you all encouragement series of sort of short focused recommendations. Love Local has been mentioned a few times. Uh, this, I'm gonna show you a video just to try and encapsulate what we're trying to do here. It's going back to that story. You as a community own the place that you live in. You know, you're not just a bit part player. You have to step up to the plate and take ownership and work in collaboration with all of the other stakeholders. Love Local is about how we will be living our lives in the future post pandemic. We will be traveling to work less often. We'll be staying in our local locations more often. We need to think about rewarding our retailers, our reconnecting with green space, our local communities and being kind, et cetera. The stuff that Nancy talked about in, in, in Lark Hall and, 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 and Tannehill and James down in Campbelltown. So let me just play a wee video and then I'll just bring things to a close in a couple of minutes. No one else 
Just touch my hair, but hair though. If I'm looking for the guest, I'll probably go to the weekend. And you help us set up for the beauty shop. Every day I get my coffee in the morning. When you shop at local businesses, your money stays local for longer. Shop local and support Scotland's towns. <sighs> Okay, guys, that, that, that was the first of our adverts. If you actually are watching STV anytime now, you'll see the latest iteration of that, which is about choosing local. So I think, again, it's really important that you guys as community groups embrace this. The, 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 the potential with this is phenomenal. The money stays in the local economy. People like Amazon and Asos and Boohoo and these people are not allowed to benefit from this. So the money multiplies in your local economy and allows you to build back a more resilient Scotland. It also can reward good behaviour. You can reward your volunteers. You can get your corporates to feed in. So Nancy's point about corporates want to help, but they don't know how. So we've been talking to the likes of Scott Real, Scott Mid, you know, the, the bigger Boots PLC who are saying, well, we could actually reward all our staff and our volunteers using this card. And we know that that money is going to go back into the local economy. So just very briefly, the, the sort of things that we can help you with in terms of developing your plans and taking your projects forward. We have the Understanding Scottish Places platform, that unique typology tool that actually allows you to understand how your place works and which towns in Scotland you're most like. We also have the Town Audit, the Place Standard, which is really helpful in terms of getting to consensual agreement around priorities. We've just redone the Town Toolkit, so please go and have a look at that. That's within the uh, scotlandtowns.org website. But a fantastic resource that shows you how to how to eat that elephant, how to make that first step. Where do you get your money from? How, what sort of legal structure is the best to, to take your projects forward? So it's a real encyclopedia of knowledge, a lot of case studies to actually provoke inspiration and, and to help you with your journey. We also help Scottish Government to uh, issue funding. You, you host a lot of good case studies, host the workshops. And probably the most important thing is our network. So whenever you do hit a brick wall or there's a particular problem, please feel free to come and contact us because we have a load of connections that can help you. So hopefully um, these stories and inspiration and passion can actually help inspire some good uh, applications this year. I'm going to sign off with another buzzword. And this is going back to James' point about the difficulty of people. This, uh, this is an Irish shillelagh. And uh, let me just stop sharing the screen. This is an Irish shillelagh, and that's going to be my buzzword, shillelagh. It's very hard to pronounce. But James, see the next time you've got a person problem, the Irish use the shillelagh to knock a wee bit of sense into them. So feel free to use your shillelagh, liberally, if needed. Right, back to you, and thank you. Thank you very much, So Obviously, Scotland's Towns Partnership will be handing out branded shillelaghs at all their future events for us to use to uh, help us with relationship building or relationship control. Um, I would echo a lot of what Phil has said, particularly the toolkit they've just launched, which I think many will know, of you will know that maybe Nick Wright was involved in. Um, it is an excellent piece of work. And it, it shows that, as I think Nancy said, Rome wasn't built in a day. Um, James has talked about the length of time it can take to do things. These are complex issues in regeneration and they take a long time. The toolkit is totally upfront about the amount of work that it takes, but it is very explicit and clear about how you can go about doing that. So I would strongly recommend that everyone has a look at that if you've not already had a look at it. I'm now going to move on to our final speaker, and that's Margaret McSporn from Highlands and Island Enterprise. Margaret, um, unmute, and uh, Chris is already sharing the presentation. That's great, thank you, Ewan. Thank you, Chris. Um, I'll just say next, um, as, uh, as and when. Um, folks, a, just a wee bit of background here. Um, hi, uh, sponsors the community-led award with a uh, surf each year and um, I'm particularly passionate about that um, in part because a uh, community-led development is within the DNA of Pi. Um, we were set up in 1965 but as, as one of Scotland's three enterprise agencies we and south of Scotland were set up with community development embedded within the act that established us. So we tend to take 
a more holistic approach. Our ambition is inclusion, uh, so growth across the Highlands and Islands, um, and um, now a real focus on net zero. So some of the work that we're doing that I won't really go into great detail on is um, growing uh, the energy generation sector. So we have a subsidiary entity called Wave Energy Scotland uh, focused on trying to, to, to grow that. We're working to establish what opportunities there are in the space sector for the Highlands and Islands. And again, that is both in terms of communities, but also in terms of private entities. So um, that maybe gives you a wee bit of a flavour for our, our wider work. Um, so as Highlands and Islands, uh, we work on a, on a geography from Shetland to Argyll, right down to the Mull of Kintyre. Um, and we have eight uh, local entities, local uh, enterprise offices, um, out of which we deliver the strategy in sub areas. Um, and the reason for that is to ensure that we are as um, close to the communities that we work for as possible. Um, and in that being as close to them, that we can work with those communities positively to take forward developments. Um, so our vision is that we want, sorry, our vision, sorry, next please, Chris. Our vision is that we want the Highlands and Islands to be prosperous, inclusive, sustainable re region, attracting more people to live, work, study, invest and visit. So with a vision like that, you can see how absolutely essential communities are uh, to achieving that vision. Our priorities uh, in trying to achieve that, uh, that uh, vision are to build successful, productive and resilient businesses, um, enable strong, capable and resourceful communities and create the conditions for growth and green recovery. So in building successful, productive and resilient businesses, if I tie back to uh, James's presentation and thank you for doing so much work for me early doors, James, um, the Royal Hotel in Campbelltown, um, we worked to secure an inward investor who came in to uh, redevelop that and another significant hotel uh, in the area. And uh, in that redevelopment, it's contributing to the growth of the Campbelltown area. Um, so we uh, invested in the redevelopment there um, and work alongside that inward investor. Um, enable strong, capable and resourceful communities. Again, sticking with the Campbelltown um, example, uh, the Campbelltown Picture House, um, working with them to look at what their uh, regeneration project really needed to be, um, establishing the funding package and Im implementing that. And um, if you haven't planned your summer holidays yet, or even your winter ones, um, a visit to Campbelltown is definitely a must. Um, and a, a visit to the Picture House is an absolute necessity. Next, please, Chris. So uh, we work with businesses, communities and social enterprises. I won't labour that point any further. In strengthening communities in place, so move next, please, Chris. We work with strengthening communities in place to build resilience and capacity, to develop community assets and to encourage moves to a uh, net zero and the green recovery. Um, we basically work to try and enable communities to contribute to the social and economic and, uh, well-being of growth in the region. Next, please, Chris. On our website, we've built um, an area where we've drawn together examples of work done by our communities to address the COVID-19 emergency response and recovery. And that will exemplify a lot of the work that we did um, in working with our community anchor organisations across the Highlands and Islands in activity um, that really benefited um, the communities and the areas and most of all the people uh, in those areas. Um, next slide, please, Chris. Uh, just to mention uh, Go Places, this is a, a 
newsletter that we publish frequently and is on our website and it tries to draw together um, some of the information that can be of value to individuals looking at um, how to develop their project or what experience others have had in uh, implementing projects that can benefit um, the places in which they live. So um, back again to high uh, passion about community-led. Um, last year's winner, Ochiltree, uh, exemplified drawing from the bottom up the, the, the passion and the development of their project and how they implemented it. Um, James has talked this morning about Tannehill and absolutely um, they're uh, advancing down that track. And we've all recognised today, it is a very long track that you get on when you do these projects. And um, James Lafferty, and you, 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 may, you, you may be getting a, a little sense of Campbelltown. I live on the island of Gia. Campbelltown is my local town. Um, the change that has been made over the last 15 years is significant. Um, and uh, I may have a little bit of bias towards Campbelltown, uh, if I'm being really, really honest. So uh, community-led is a significant part of High's DNA and that of the south of Scotland. We are here. Um, so what you asked earlier, Ewan, what's the new future? Um, for us, it's more of these fantastic developments that make such a positive difference to people living in positive places. Um, and we're looking forward to keeping continuing uh, with these projects across the Highlands and Islands and the collaborations that, that make such a difference. Um, a key piece is uh, that comes through for me is the work that goes into engaging people and ensuring that those people are bought into the direction of travel for their communities and that you then enable that to, to, to happen. So this is very much not about a government delivery arm um, imposing change in places. It's about how we facilitate and work with individuals in places to make these changes happen. Next, please, Chris. So uh, just a few areas in the slides uh, where you can find out a bit more about what we do and how we do it. And um, if anyone has any questions beyond this, please do get in touch. Emma knows how to, to put in touch with me if you've got any questions that you want to follow up on. Ewan, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Margaret, for that. And thank you for mentioning some of the other um, previous Surf Award winners. Um, and Uncle Tree, I know, is one that we'll be using as a case study. Um, uh, another event that we're uh, participating in uh, at the end of uh, August. Um, so I've asked if anyone has any questions or any observations they would like to make to our representatives from public bodies about how we know that there's a large 325 million um, there for the next five years, 140 million already to projects from local authorities. Does anyone have any questions for our, our, our last three speakers? We do still have an outstanding question for one of our last speakers. There was a question asked for you, Nancy, um, which you partially answered because I think somebody was asking around how you surveyed and engaged with the community due to the pandemic. And I know that the survey for the local outcomes plan was done prior to uh, COVID. So you'd, you have a, a bank of information there, but how did you actually engage with people during the pandemic when it was maybe not so possible to to meet together? Yeah, well, we were supposed to launch our survey report in on something like the 28th of March in 2020, and it was all scuppered because of COVID. So we had to do that online. And I think in our survey, there's, there's 18,000 people in our area, and I think 1800, we had 1,812 responses to our survey. So um, of that, 600 people agreed to be on our list of um, uh, people who were looking for more information and wanted to be involved. So we've got that. Uh, to be able to pass on information and also a, a Facebook page to be used social media. And there's lots of, um, Liz on the call here and myself, we are sort of admin and some like three or four different social media groups across 
uh, the Lark Hall area. So we can uh, share a lot of information via that. But obviously the ones that are missing there are the folks who don't have access to the internet, folks who are not on social media. So um, during the, the actual uh, process of the engagement, we were out in the streets. We went to every coffee morning that was ever there. We spoke to every men's group. And um, so we were making connections locally uh, that we probably can build on going forward. Um, but I think the fact that we've got so many organisations involved in the partnership, they cover such a wide range of people that it's actually, I wouldn't say easy, but um, it gives us a vehicle to actually pass on information uh, and a lot more readily than we were before. And in a, in a town the size of ours, word of mouth is an amazing tool. You know, um, although sometimes by the time it gets to the 10th person, the story might have changed. But then, <laughs> The sentiments the same. So, yeah, we use really uh, social media and um, the folks who are out on, and about on, on volunteering during the year um, were actually passing on pieces of information um, like what help do you need, who, who's, um, who can, who's your, your, your closest person. Some people just didn't have any relations in this town and they were they were reliant on other folks and of course the, 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 the daughters and the, the sons were contacting us to say will you go and see my mum you know so I mean all that stress that people were, were suffering is the, the reality of, of, of what Covid was. Mm -hmm. Okay thanks very much Nancy and I think um, previous experience in other uh, settlements the connection of ex using existing groups sometimes when we're looking at problems there's a desire to set up something new but actually there are existing organisations and communities within where you live that we need some people are maybe not aware of and two places that I'm familiar with because I had board members that lived them in Falkland and Cooper you know they spent about the first year just making sure they connected everybody having putting up lists of all the organizations and community groups that existed in their places which has led to them working ultimately in Cooper uh, working with uh, Phil and has led to quite a lot of uh, regeneration and development trust being created um, there's some questions come in. Joanne, that was a question for you about when is the Our Place portal going live? I got told maybe the end of July. <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid I, I don't know exactly. Um, I get told and then it gets changed. So <laughs> I'd have to go back to my planning colleagues to give you the correct answer to that. Um, yeah, Soon. I can I can try and update. Uh, fill a new in and get the word out as soon as we know for sure. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Alistair Scott's making an interesting point, question, and he's saying continuity is key. And is that easier in rural situations than it is in cities where cities can have more transient populations? I don't know if anybody has any observation on that. So it's, just, it's really just an observation from me, Ewan. Um, um, I'm from Architecture and Design Scotland, but my main um, my career is as an architect, and I just found it so much easier to get this continuity uh, to happen in rural small communities than it is in our cities. Um, continuity is the key. I think James said the big, the big uh, message of the whole day in that it is about having the same people involved in the same parties for a long, long period of time. Um, regeneration is a bit like growing a garden. It takes, it takes time to do. Um, we have seriously struggled in cities. I mean, I've been involved in, you know, places like Craig Miller for 20 years, and we've had um, organisations start, organisations close, um, people come, people go. And I just wondered if there's any kind of thoughts on that, of how the two situations might be different and, you know, might be approached. Anything from... Our public bodies, obviously, Margaret's experience is, is in is in the Highlands Islands. Um, whereas Phil and Joanne, do you have any perceptions on how this could happen in larger settlements? How we maintain that continuity? I, I would agree to a certain extent with what Alistair said. It's certainly, in the city centre proper, <clears throat> it's very transient, and normally you would need the sort of public and commercial sectors to curate that space. But I would argue that there are there are neighborhoods within cities that are quite static and you know you could grow your garden so you know you go to maybe Kelvin side in, in, in Glasgow or Shawlands you'll have people there that have been rooted for, for a very long time there's some fantastic work that the Shawlands bid 
is undertaken just now that brings in community and thinks about the vulnerable and you know builds in a wee bit of resilience. So it, it's a it's a well made point though because you know having having that sort of longevity, then what James has been able to do over the course of fifteen years, it is a long haul. You know, it's a big big jigsaw that needs to have energy injected at different times, resources injected at different times. So you know the transient nature of how we have lived this, this last 30, 40 years where we have been much more agile and we have been more global. I think the COVID pandemic is going to actually draw that back in and people will be a wee bit more local, which maybe then can mean they'll be static for a longer period of time and we can build on that. And obviously net zero ambition, you know, stopping people commuting so much or having to go long distances to find economic opportunities. I think again, we'll both play in positively to address that point. But it is a good point. I mean, look at the, to, to me, if I'm the head of place in Scottish government, the areas that are giving me most concern are the centre of Edinburgh and potentially Glasgow, where, you know, the, the normal model has been broken and there aren't a lot of people in that place living there, um, you know, to, to, to lift the reins and to start coming up with solutions. You know, Glasgow in its... Uh, if you think of Glasgow and George Square and Sucky Hall Street and, and, and so on, it's the least densely populated city within that class in Europe. Nobody lives in Glasgow city centre. You have to go to Shawlands or Denison or places like that before you find population. So city centre thinks a big issue that needs to be looked on. Um, and transients maybe will reduce because people are going to be living more localised lives. Just a thought. I think that's fearful. Carry on. Mind if I come in? Um, yeah. in, in the rural areas, the challenge that we have is the continuity of in continuity and skills of individuals to sit on boards to drive these things forward and the continuity of the vision. And I think that can still be a challenge in um, an urban area as well. Um, so where Campbelltown, I suspect, has benefited is that the commitment has the commitment to the vision has been agreed with the community but there's also been that continuity in the shape of the public sector to that and the commitment there that has kept being able to uh, nurture you know James has placed huge emphasis on people nurture those relationships with people and keep drawing them back in and checking the vision what James talking about with the Tana Hill vision is absolutely pertinent. Life moves on, you've got to keep checking the vision. So I, I, I have no access to a study that says is it easier in rural or, or urban. Um, I've only got 25 years of rural experience really. Um, so uh, it's, a, it, it's, it's perhaps a bit different, but um, I, I think, I think the, the, the issue is there um, regardless of the the population density. It's the big issue, isn't it? It's one of the really big issues. And also, Thank I think in, in communities in rural or urban, making sure that people have the have the resource that they're not exhausted by it. Um, because I suppose yeah. volunteer exhaustion is something that um, but we're all aware of, and Nancy, I was particularly aware of it with the work that you've been doing in Lark Hall, and you want to make sure that uh, people are supported and that people's volunteering is not um, extractive uh, um, of, of the community, but making sure that that capacity continues. We have some other questions that have come in. Um, Diane Gray is asking for any of the speakers, given the challenges of the last year, what is the most important for public funders to support in the next 12 months? So that could be from any of the speakers, including our, our, our previous three, James, Nancy and uh, Jamie. Margaret, you have your hand up. For me, it's recovery. It's where, it's where, there's, where, the, where there's recovery activity taking place in communities that helps those communities to, to strengthen and grow as we navigate towards that slightly different picture that Phil refers to. Um, so where there's recovery activity, but um, absolutely to be linked to inclusion and 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 net, the net zero activity. Um, 
because otherwise we, we won't actually achieve that strategic direction at all. Okay, anyone else? I, I was just going to say, um, there's, I suppose there's a huge expectation for us to continue a lot of the services we've been delivering. Um, and we've got plans to do that, but it's quite resource intensive. Um, I think another thing is just the trust that funders have shown in us. Um, they've been quick and nimble in responding. It's been really refreshing. I'd love that to continue, um, but I don't know if it will. Okay, that's a, that's a, good, a good message back to you, Diane, as, as, as a funder, um, about the trust that funders have shown, and also the simplification process that um, some funders have, have engaged in, in the um, funding application uh, process. Diane, do you want to respond to that, seeing as you've un yeah, unveiled sorry. yourself? It, it, it was a bit of a mean question, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, <laughs> I suppose within, you know, within the parameters of what we're talking about, regeneration in place, um, and thinking about, uh, so I work for the Heritage Fund, National Lottery Heritage Fund, we'll continue to make capital investment for sure over the next 12 months and commitments to that. But um, we always make that alongside um, investing in um, activities and engagement and involving people, which has obviously come out so strongly this morning. Um, so yeah, I suppose for us, it's just thinking how, um, how do we invest the, the funds that we have over the next period of time? And I was just interested to see what um, might come out from um, some different speakers. But yeah, that transition um, to the next, um, whatever things will look like in, in the next uh, year, two years, three years, um, seems to me that's really important, that change process. And it's as important how we invest as to what we invest in. So thinking about the trust and whatever that Jamie's talking about. Sorry, yeah, uh, I did the main question. No, uh, no, but a valid question and a thought provoking one. But I suppose it's picked up actually on some of the questions that have come in after that around uh, Ian's question around the optimal mix between community group work and local authority officer input slash support. Um, and Nancy's also replied, um, I think, to that question. But I don't know if um, James, you have any observation actually on that around where the balance lies, where the where you need local authority input, and I suppose it ties into Nancy's question about power dynamics, because I think some of the work we do, we've done an, an event with our um, Alliance for Action in Danoon, and the, the power dynamic was strongly discussed by local volunteers there, where the local authority is in a long-term paid position, um, guaranteed um, for now. Um, Whereas the community workers are in a much more peripatetic um, uh, and maybe a slightly isolated position. So I don't know what you would say from your perspective in Campbelltown, that balance between the community, the bottom up stuff that you refer to Cliff doing and your position within the, the local government. Yeah, well, I mean, I think where we've benefited in Campbelltown has been the fact that it's been the three five year schemes merged into one large project and the fact quite often in cars and THI schemes throughout the country, the officer might not live in the area or they might move to the area for a few years then move away from the area straight after the project as we've even seen in some of our towns like Inverary. So I think it's and it's been well known locally as well, you know, with me living in the town. Um, and then when you've got some successful projects, more and more people get to know you. So. I think it is a tricky balance. I don't, I don't think there's one size fits all. I think it's just going to, it's like most of these things um, with delivering a, any sort of regeneration project, there's, you can't, there's no sort of set rules. It just depends on the circumstances at the time. So, I mean, it's difficult, as you say, with council budgets at the moment to say that you're going to have a, a dedicated officer for one particular town for the next 10 or 20 years. I mean, I'm covering like Gilphead now, but after the five year scheme ends, um, I, I don't know, I might be moving to work in another town, you know, so what happens there? I mean, it's only 50 mile away, so I'll probably keep a handle on it the same way I'm keeping a handle on Campbelltown. Then it becomes a resource issue as well, because I'm still involved in issues with buildings that I've delivered here 10 years ago. So I just need to see how it goes and keep plumbing away and doing what we can, but um, I don't really know what the, the magic what, magic answer is. I suppose what you're saying actually, James, reflects, you know, the issues of subsidiarity of local decision making, you know, a personal perspective for me is that 
having people live in the areas in which they are making decisions, whether or not that's planning decisions or whether or not that's funding decisions, makes a major difference. We have to consult communities currently at scale, maybe because the people who are making the decisions are not embedded in the communities. And having people embedded in the communities who are part of some form of government structure, there's huge benefits um, to that because they know the community and they also know what the impact of the decision, they will be living with the impact uh, of the, the decision making. Um, where if we talk about where health professionals or where politicians choose to live and their representation, I think the same actually applies actually with the local authority level and actually James, your long term work in Campbelltown. And exemplifies that. It's 20 past 12. We are now having to wrap up. Sorry if I haven't taken your questions. Some of them have been very good questions that we've not uh, had time to take. So um, thank you very much to our speakers, um, Jamie Lallan, James Lafferty, Nancy Barr, Joanne Boyle from Apprentice and Margaret McSporn. And today's also a good example of the fact that um, while we are not physically in the same space, it's enabled Margaret to be with us from GIA. Um, so digital inclusion is something that is hugely important and there is still a lot of work to be done on that, but there are benefits to it and there are benefits to our carbon footprint uh, of our event today because we have been able to do this remotely. But just before we wind up, I'm just going to hand over to Emma to give a brief advert for future surf activities. Uh, thanks, you. And I have put a couple of links. My copy and paste went a bit mad, so there's a couple of links uh, referring to this in the chat bar. So I will just take um, a couple of minutes. Can you, I'm just going to share my screen quickly. And then just get this to work. This is all just decided to go to pot today. Um, so just um, quickly, just about this year's Surf Award. So this year's Surf Award image last year, I mean, we've had lots of things from frogs and ducks. Um, and this year we've got a bear. Um, the bear signifies a kind of coming out of hibernation as the world starts to hopefully reopen and things have maybe changed, um, much to like what happens to a bear when he comes out of his cave. Um, so this year's award is launched on the 3rd of June and they're open for applications until 5pm on Monday the 6th of September. So still plenty of time to get an application in. The five categories remain the same as last year and the community led and Scotland's most improved place categories are both still in there, still supported thankfully by HI and STP and Architecture and Design Scotland. The awards dinner, which we're hoping will go ahead in a physical format this year, is set for the 9th of December in the Grand Central Hotel in Glasgow and there's a link there on the screen to the SUF website for the application materials but I've also put that in the chat bar. Um, so just a quick plug for SUF membership. If you're not a SUF member already, um, it's £50 for organisations and £20 for community groups and individuals. From that, you get a way to promote your wider network about your activities. Um, you get to input into co policy consultations that we are, that we do, and you get to first-hand information on anything that SUF are doing, and you get a pre-booking period for all SUF events. So there's some information on that um, on the SUF website under the Join SUF section, or you can drop me an email. And just lastly, some um, events that we've got coming up. So this is the third in our shared learning event, and there's one more that's happening next week. And HIT features the three Creative Regeneration Awards along with Creative, um, Creative Scotland. So that's next Thursday at the same time. The SURF annual conference is coming up and it's split again. It'll be virtual and it's split over three days um, and it focuses the overarching theme is partners in place and the sessions focus on post-COVID recovery, um, place-based regeneration and then climate change. Um, and we've got some good speakers in there, including the new Minister for Planning and Community Wealth, Tom Arthur. Um, and then lastly, as I said, the awards dinner, which there's no information out on yet, but we're hoping that will be the 9th of December. So again, all of that's on the events section, but I will send some information along with today's recording and a link to today's materials following the event. And that's me. Thank you very much, Emma. And again, thank you very much to our speakers. Thank you very much to our audience. Hopefully it's sunny where you are. I've lost my view. It's thick fog outside of my window in Edinburgh. It's the, the light of the East Coast Har. Um, so I hope for those of you who are outside of the uh, perimeter of the Har, you can go enjoy um, what looks like it's going to be a sunny, the sunny will continue for the next uh, few days. And I look forward to meeting you all in person 
um, at some point at future surf events. So thank you very much.